Hello, ladies and gentlemen. I'm Domiziano Arcangeli. Uh, you may call me Domi, as uh, I have been billed as Domi in a few shows in America. It's a little easier. I am an actor, writer, producer, and uh, director lately. Oh well, how long I've been acting, uh, <laughs> it's actually, you know, you may think I'm uh, so old if I tell you, I start in 1980, which is a long, long time ago, I know, and I'm, I'm, I'm really not that old, I'm not a vampire or anything, although I played a few, <laughs> no, I'm just kidding, I, I, I was discovered by a famous photographer, Helmut Newton, in Venice, where I used to live, Venice, Italy, not California. <laughs> and uh, he, I don't know, he, he saw in this barely 12 years old uh, uh, some quality uh, and as a extreme artistic photography and high fashion photographer. He convinced my my grandmother, who was really fond of artists, her house was always, uh, you know, filled with directors, writers, intellectuals, and, and photographers. And so I met Helmut. He took me to Berlin, and we did a few photo shoots, which gained eventually a lot of popularity and some controversy because of my age. Age, you know, I was obviously really, really young, and uh, some of this photography it was amazing, but you know, obviously, uh, thought provoking. In fact, I made uh, quite a few, quite a few covers right away internationally. Then uh, Louis Buñuel and Federico Fellini and Michelangelo Antonioni immediately spotted me. I mean, that's no small affair, right? Although, however, I must say back then, I didn't even know who they were. So <laughs> but um, Federico Fellini actually directed my first uh, screen test at the famous legendary Cinecittà Studios where they shot movies like Cleopatra or, you know, all those great films back then. Um, for me, it was like going to the Luna Park, you know, like in this huge sound stage with all this lights and you know, and this very powerful man at the end of, of the of the set on the other side of the camera is telling me what to do. I I wasn't scared, but I was certainly amused and and, and very curious. I I um, I got the job. And uh, it was not a Federico Fellini movie, actually, to be quite honest. It was a film that one of his very, very close friend and uh, uh, long-time writers, collaborators from the times of La Dolce Vita, his award-winning film, um, had, um, you know, had decided to make as, as a first feature, as his own film, as a director. And so I got the role, and uh, later on, I must say, I was so lucky to be actually called by Federico Fellini himself for Intervista, one of his, uh, his uh, second to last film, which was uh, an extraordinary, uh, incredible, you know, vision of the movies into the movies. Intervista was, a, which means interview, it was actually based on an interview that is done directly to Fellini and he, he is really like an actor in the movie of course playing himself and he talks about you know different episodes of his life as a filmmaker so they're all little vignettes you know uh, sort of like uh, making together a wonderful ensemble of the, the all Italian 
filmmaking, and, and there were all of the stars, from Anita Ekberg to Marcello Mastroianni, Nastasha Kinski, all the classic uh, names of, of that time. And it, it was an amazing, amazing experience. I mean, I, I consider myself a very lucky. I just wish that sometimes, actually, it happened now, or it had happened, you know, a few years ago, because I could make so much more out of it. Back then, I was still like 15, 16 years old, and uh, as much as I know at that point, we was. And of course, I, I, I actually, <laughs> some kind of responsibility. I, I still, you know, when you're a teenager, you're like, oh, when is this all going to be done? <laughs> I can go and play with my buddies, you know. But, um, yeah, so that's it's so long ago. I, I cannot even remember some of the movies. Sometimes some people, you know, it's funny because I had a career that always went from up and downs, and I am very straightforward and open about this because everybody can, you know, see it from my credits. However, I work steady, I mean, like at least three, four, five even titles every year, not even counting plays or whatever else. Um, and, um, you know, some of them were really interesting movies. Um, I worked with a uh, director, uh, his name was uh, Franco Bruzzati, who was actually another Academy Award winner, director for To Forget Venice, just the film before the one I shot, which was called The Good Soldier. And I, I was playing a very ambiguous little boy with a frightening stare, <laughs> raised by a very bizarre aunt, and that was really a really important film at the time and and another very important what was a movie about San Francis of Assisi starring uh, Mickey Rourke in the in, you know in the role of San Francis believe it or not and uh, and he had done such an amazing job and Helena Bonham Carter uh, there was even Sir Lawrence Olivier playing one of his last last cameos it was a big epic film that went to Cannes and, uh, and internationally, and I was playing one of the little brothers, you know, of St. Francis, so that was uh, pretty much a long shoot. But next to this uh, more important authorial, you know, films, I also always worked in genre films, in cult films, and uh, despite my agents at the time were sort of against that because they were afraid uh, it would just give me too much of an uh, image of a B actor, you know, as often often happens, and it did happen at some point. But now, <laughs> it's kind of funny that it all turned, uh, you know, upside down because the new directors, the new generations here in America and not just Quentin Tarantino or Eli Roth or those guys, but a lot of a lot of the youngsters know so much about those obscure B genre movies. And sometimes I must tell you, when they ask me about a title, I go like, I blank, and I go like, ah. <laughs> and honestly, yes, of course, I remember the title or a co-star or someone, but I cannot remember the story. So I'm like, it's been so long ago. Damn. Time, you know, time flies. <laughs> okay, well, uh, out of, I don't remember how many titles, but I must tell you, there are quite a few. Uh, my favorite role was actually my first lead role in a movie called The Boy from Eblos, which won the Grand Jury Prize at the Venice Film Festival in 1984. And um, it also starred uh, two great, fantastic cult actors from that time, Teresa on Savoy and John Mulder Brown from uh, John, I'm sorry, from Jersey Skolimowski's Deep End, and uh, a bunch of others, of course. 
it was a very sensitive drama. And for the first time, after a few years of uh, of interesting role, but you know, more more supporting roles as a you know the young, uh, the very very young teenager, troubled teenager. I was I was finally the boy from Evolust, and I. I was this, uh, you know, troubled youth that, in a way, came out uh, to many as as a little bit of a of a emblematic, defining character for for that time, the early '80s, at least in Europe, where you know we're famous for. Uh, very young teenagers doing heroin and uh, you know just uh, falling into that spiral downfall and uh, but it was very poetic and uh, I, I felt I was extremely well directed and uh, for my age for what my experience was that was certainly what I can I can still recall as my favorite favorite part. However, you know, it's been so long ago and uh, we, we we are always projected to, to the future. I mean I, I always I always say the last one is always the better, the best, the, the most interesting. This time I must say actually the next one is going to be <laughs> I'm uh, I'm extremely hyped about this new project that I'm uh, actually executive producing with uh, Stephen Hansen. Uh, this is a great young partner, um, really great people, and also Joe Johnston and uh, Academy Award-winning director, uh, Chinese called uh, Zhang Yimou, or Raise the Red Lantern, and. Um, and it's a movie called El Toro, and uh, it's been it's been written for me. Uh, I can only say that it's going to be an extremely visionary. I think Baz Luhrmann meets Fellini meets uh, rappers East LA through an ancient Greek legend, the legend of the Minotaur. Uh, completely remodernized, a little bit like Baz Luhrmann had done with Rome Romeo and Juliet, starring Leonardo DiCaprio. And th this role, I, it's for me, honestly, and I, I just say it, I have to start production in two months, so I'm, I'm already preparing, And but it's sort of like a make it or break it type of situation. You know, after so many years, it's got to be good. It's got to be good! <laughs> <laughs> what kind of role I'd like to play and I haven't yet. I must say I have played, I was so lucky, you know, to being raised with the movies or with the plays and I sort of played period and uh, different times and, and and also I grew up really so from, you know, like child teenager to young actor to 30s, now 40, you know, I. I sort of like played many different parts, but there is there is a couple of, uh, of roles that I I would really love to play. One is uh, a famous novel from a Thomas Mann, who also wrote the famous novel Death in Venice, a famous movie by Luchino Visconti back in 1971. This one was called Tonio Kroger. And it's the story of uh, it's the story of a man. I you know I'm gonna try to make it as short as possible. He, he is a man that he doesn't he cannot live his life. He's uh, he feels always the outcast because in this northern European town, and uh, everybody is blonde and beautiful at his eyes, anyways, in the surface. And he feels like dark and you know and smaller and 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 and, and really introverted, and he has this uh, passion, but it's it's a totally pure passion for a young couple, 
that loves each other so much. And he obviously loves her. You know, she's this beautiful blonde eye, blonde hair and blue-eyed girl. And uh, her fiancé is also a great-looking guy. And at one point, their families decide that she has to marry someone else. And she's uh, destroyed by the decision. And she, you know, totally rejects it. However, she knows that she won't be able to uh, do anything but. But she uses little Tonio to be a sort of go-between, between between her and her ex-fiancé, who's now her real illicit lover. So while Tonio Kroger thinks to be doing a great things for them, and, and, you know, and to be you know, this wonderful uh, messenger of love is actually just being used to uh, to basically, you know, set up the rendezvous between them. At the end, a big scandal comes out out of this, and he's the one who's actually being blamed by the old family sort of to cover. You know, times will go by, It'll grow up very, very dry, very uh, disappointed and jaded in some sort of ways by life. Of course, he won't ever have a family. But later on, as a diplomat, he'll get one last call from her, from the beautiful lady who once he had loved so much. And... uh, he goes in and he sees her as an old lady and uh, for the last time acknowledging what is done she'll ask him another favor this time for a niece so his life is just you know uh, a love messenger basically and I don't know I think there is an enormous uh, spiritual in depth in, in this of course I, I, you know, I don't know who could shoot such a film today with that incredible sensibility. Maybe Roman Polanski. Uh, <laughs> that would be a dream project. <laughs> yes, I acted in uh, many movies while I was in Europe throughout the 80s and 90s. In the 80s, I was also a model. Then I became also a well-known stage actor. In fact, I, and I'd like to mention this because, you know, it's not very well known, but I did a lot of work in, in, in wonderful plays. And some of them toured the world. Um, and that was exceptional training, of course. At one point, uh, I felt like, and it wasn't just me, it's real, um, a deep crisis, especially in Italy, of the, of the f- of, of films, of filmmaking. And uh, unfortunately, because, I mean, Italian cinema has always been one of the most uh, recognized. All of a sudden, a few years, for political reasons, whatever it is, you know, it's sort of like went through uh, a really deep crisis. So I was like, you know, I'm an actor. I'm an artist. I always considered myself an artist. And uh, I, I always felt like I... You know, artists should not have, like, boundaries. They should not have, like, countries or, you know, belonging. And we all know it's not like that because there are a lot of pros and cons. But I must say that the transition and deciding to come to a YLA, well, it wasn't a jam. I must say this. My mother is an American citizen, so I had a U.S. passport since I was a kid. And uh, since my parents had to split when I was a kid, I also visited. I had friends here. I had friends in Los Angeles that are still my friends. They're still my good friends. And, And so after a long tour with a play, I decided, you know, instead of going back to Rome and trying to do the same things or, you know, why don't, why don't I go to Los Angeles and give it a try? And uh, 
I, I felt somewhat brave, although I knew the city already, but, you know, it was some sort of a real, you know, a real big decision anyways, because, you know, you leave, you sort of live an established or quite established uh, ground to be in Hollywood all of a sudden, which is great because there is a lot of production, there are great directors, there is also, you know, so much to do all the time, and it's such a thrilling city to be in. Um, but it was, it wasn't easy, you know, and also, however, you know, I've been acquainted to America, I also had an accent, a foreign accent that, you know, immediately sort of, you know, cuts some roles, and and not that I want to play the boy, the, ne the man next door at this point, in fact, uh, I'm, I'm sort of becoming a villain, which I think it's, it's, it's been my great transition, you know. You, you have, I think, uh, to, to reinvent yourself all the time in order to stay up and, and keep ticketing, let's say, as, as an actor, as a performer, especially. Um, but I was quite lucky, though. I must say that after a few months, a casting director brought me into Showtime, and there was a poor Zalman King who I really loved because it was really, you know, one of the reasons actually, I must say, not just because it's died uh, two months ago, but, uh, you know, one of the reasons because I'm in LA and I got established here, it, it's also because of Zalman, Zalman King. He was after the, you know, nine and a half weeks, I read Shoe Diaries, casting for his new Showtime TV series, which was called Chromium Blue. And um, casting director brought me in. Zalman knew a little bit of my work in some uh, very edgy European films I had made. And so it was just like, you know, a matter of having a conversation. And in five minutes, said, you are this character. And, you know, I was one of the regulars for two years on the show. So that definitely was a good, was, was a good start, an easier way to break in. However, you know, it's been a challenge ever so, because after that, yes, there was, I, I was in the restaurant for NBC with Rocco the Spirito, which was a lot of fun. I was in The Girls Next Door, uh, you know, Yogi Hafner, The Girls Next Door, um, and in a bunch of indie films. Um, some of them really good, some of them not so good, you know? And I'm honest, I'm upfront, I must say. But as an actor, you, you know, you take a chance. When someone, you know, tells you a story and you think, whoa, you know, and you don't, I don't, I don't feel like looking down at jobs, you know? I, I'm very straightforward, I love what I do. So I'm not the type of actor that feels, you know, compelled to say no because, Maybe I feel like I've done some work and I should be saying no because of my past or whatever. I'm, uh, I love to work. So, yeah, I've done a few not so great films, but I've done a few good ones. And unfortunately, you know, it's kind of funny in a way that the not so great ones sometimes are more visible and <laughs> and the good ones have somewhat of a much harder path to come even to a you know very limited uh, distribution or dvd so that was taxing at times and frustrating but you know i never got discouraged i i keep on going always with a lot, a lot of uh, sympathy, especially for new directors. I like the challenge to work with new directors. And some of the kids, you know, they they know so much sometimes about even what I had done, you know, back then. And I go, it's it's not just because it's like, you know, I feel like I'm uh, 
I'm flattered. It's not just that, honestly. It's because I see in them the capacity of understanding such a different type of cinema, you know, from from their background. And so I'm like, you know, if if they get this, they'll they'll get how it is working with me. And you know, and <laughs> sometimes it works really good. Sometimes it doesn't work so good. But you know, that's life. That's the path we choose. So, well, next uh, you can see me in a few movies, actually. I've been very proactive between 2011 and 2012. So, um, this year we'll have a, a few, not to mention the ones available right now, House of Flush Mannequins, that's doing really well, finally after winning a bunch of awards. It's an art film uh, um, where I lead and also I produced. Um, there is uh, a supernatural thriller uh, from Lionsgate opening at the end of August, big. It's called The Ghost Maker, and uh, it's, a, it's, a very, it's a very thrilling story about a few kids uh, pulled into the world of uh, meth addiction, but at the same time they also discover a new way to touch the supernatural, the unknown uh, side of, uh, of the other life. Whether it's because of the drug effects or because it's real, that's uh, the, main <laughs> the main question of the movie. I, I'm really happy with it. It's, it's, uh, it's looking great and I'm happy Lionsgate is really pushing it a lot. Uh, then I'm uh, having a recurring role as a very sexy but devious gangster, Shaka, in this hyped uh, new uh, TV series. It's the second season, actually, of this series of Femme Fatales for Cinemax, which is kind of hype, uh, very Sin City meets uh, Pulp Fiction meets Erotica, in a way. You know, it's, it's, it's really cool. Um, then there is a movie that I really loved making um, from award-winning um, uh, Sundance uh, Best Director in 1994, uh, Everett Lewis, who was also one of the main professors at U USC. Uh, great director, great person. The movie is called Territory. It's been picked up by Focus. And it's, uh, it's basically about the, the art world. This, all this new extravagant scene, uh, downtown LA in the arts and fashion district. It's, it's, it's a very, very cool movie. I play, I play a very complex man there. Then there is a gay romantic comedy by this new talented kid. Uh, he's so young, he's done two movies and is already very well known. The movie opens at Outfest. It's called Scenes from Gay Marriages. And that's saying a lot <laughs> because it's been a pretty realistic portrait. I think I'm not very familiar with a lot of um, you know, gay films, but this felt very um, extremely real. I, I think, you know, it's, it's, it's very true. You know, and it's a bittersweet comedy. And he himself has a style a little bit like uh, I love Woody Allen, so very sharp dialogue and very stylish. So I'm uh, very excited about that. Um, then uh, there are, oh my God, there is uh, another romantic drama and at the same time also supernatural thriller, a little bit in the vein of uh, a movie with Nicole Kidman that I had loved a lot called The Others. It's called Wrath of the Crows and uh, it was uh, shot in gorgeous locations overseas, in, uh, mostly in Italy, up, uh, up on the lakes area, Lake Como and the River Po, in the countryside where there are all these ancient castles, gothic castles, beautiful places. Wrath of the Crows opens huge, wide in Italy, 
in the fall and right after that in uh, in America. It's an international cast, mostly American or British actors, and I am the main villain. So you watch it, could be bad. <laughs> so these are the main main projects. There is also a lot more, but I I'm very I can wait to see these movies. Actually, I'm not really one of those actors who really like to watch himself a lot, but this one's I must say I cannot wait to to, to see you know to see the outcome. I'm really, I'm really excited about it. <laughs> okay, if you'd like, if you'd like to get to know more about this man here, <laughs> uh, well, there is, there are some ways. Uh, visit my website. My website uh, does have a lot of info and a lot of links. Um, so you can find a lot of, uh, you know, different information from the past and from the present and projected into the future. It's uh, www.domizianoarcangeli.com and also another very informative website. It's the site, of course, of my production company, Empire Films, and that's uh, www.empirefilms.net. And uh, again, uh, get in touch with me because I'm I'm really fond of people, and I love to have your feedbacks. I love to know not just what you think of me, but I love stories. You know, I I believe that we learn from each other. So it's, it's a great point. Let's be in touch. <laughs>